Uh, I'm very happy to have my consul with us today and to be able to introduce him for this event at the Havens Rights Center. Uh, to my mind, Mike is both an important part of and representative of certain shifts on the left end of the spectrum of US politics in recent years. I, I don't want to overgeneralize here, but an important part of the left's role over many years uh, lay primarily in critique, often a very important critique, but one that wasn't necessarily um, tied to uh, projects that it, were working in very concrete ways to build something closer to what the left wanted. Now, this is a gross overgeneralization. I don't want to argue the point, and there are many exceptions, but it does capture something about the kinds of institutional works that were sometimes absent from, uh, from the left end of the spectrum. But the last couple of electoral cycles have demonstrated the viability of a social democratic bloc within the US political system, then it needs its intellectuals and it needs its technocrats to be active in mapping out the concrete pieces of possible futures. And this is how I see the work of Mike Consul, director of macroeconomic analysis at the Roosevelt Institute, the economic think tank most linked to new progressive economic thinking. Uh, in addition to his work for the Roosevelt Institute, Mike writes widely communicating to a broad public. He writes regularly uh, on economics in the nation. He's on the editorial board of, uh, of Dissent Magazine. I became an instant admirer many years ago when he was, I am quite certain, the very first person to have mentioned Gosta Esping Anderson's Three Worlds of Welfare Capitalism in the pages of the Washington Post. Um, and he is, of course, also the author of the relatively recent book, Freedom from the Market, uh, about which he will be speaking today. He is, in my opinion, one of the vital thinkers on political economy of this era, and so I am truly delighted to welcome him today to the Havens Right Center. Over to you, Mike. Thank you. Um, can you hear me okay? Yep. Excellent. So uh, thank you for that very kind introduction. I met Patrick many years ago, um, and we wrote a piece in 2015, 2016 called Carl Pugliani for President, which started to articulate out some of these ideas and that back and forth and the reaction we got from it, which was very positive, helped inspire me to start thinking through these things more concretely and it ended up with this um, book, Freedom from the Market. I'm going to put it up on the screen here. Uh, which I'll be uh, talking about and reading from uh, various parts in the next 40 minutes. So um, I really do think that the notion of freedom is central to these debates. I've been influenced by writers such as Eric Foner, Corey Robin, many others to say that uh, ultimately much of our political disagreements are fundamentally stories about how freedom should be exercised in our society. I think over the past several decades, we've been fed an idea that free markets, the unregulated flow of goods, services, and labor are the fundamental form of freedom, and that freedom itself functions like a market. The freedom of a business owner, the freedom to sell your labor, the freedom to buy the necessities of life like health and education, these are the market opportunities that keep us free and allow us to express ourselves as members of a society, according to the kind of prevailing set of ideologies of the last several decades. This narrow, limited view is extended into many parts of our lives and is becoming like like ideology, like the air that surrounds us. But I think America's market-oriented worldview is now breaking down. At a time of political upheaval, insecurity, and pandemics, people are hungry to reclaim a world outside the market. Their desires are animating politics, especially among younger voters who are demanding that the government directly provide essential goods, while also suppressing aspects of the market that threaten to swallow our lives whole. Um, I started to sense this personally. I mean, so to give a little bit of my, my background, um, you know, I, I started working in the space after the financial crisis. Before that, I had been working in tech and finance, a bunch of other things. And after the financial crisis, it was very clear that something shook within this, both within the establishment and with the way the establishment kind of carries out and executes the economy, but I think also among everyday people and the politics that went around it. And uh, it's tough to date or you know, it'll be up to historians like Pat in the future to think through when this era starts to break down, but be it the financial crisis of 20, 2008, be it um, Brexit and Trump, this one-two punch of um, you know, very um, right-wing nas populist nationalism, um, leaving Eastern Europe and hitting the, uh, the UK and the United States, whether it's COVID uh, and the very demonstrably large efforts of governments to tr try to suppress this virus in various different forms and various different ways and the pros and cons of all their different choices, showing a much more active role of the state in the market. 
Um, things are very different now. And the ways people talk and think about markets, I think, have changed dramatically from 15 years ago to now. And um, it's almost like this ideological fog is lifting. And I think there's, you know, when you think about this, you know, there's a lot of ways to trace this history. But in terms of freedom and, and the idea of freedom, uh, you know, I think there's two real reasons, or at least two arguments for why this took hold as an intellectual argument ideologically. And one was this notion uh, Isaiah Berlin introduced uh, during the Cold War called uh, negative liberty and positive liberty. Perhaps you've, you've encountered it. It's a, it's a good, it shows up in a lot of places. And there it's argued that negative liberty is the absence of government coercion. And positive liberty is when the government is the liberty to do something that the government plays a role in. And, and it's a Cold War document. It reads very awkwardly now. Um, but the idea was that, you know, um, liberal society should really enhance negative freedom, that we should really downplay the role of the government. However, that work always had a hard time with the market economy. Um, Berlin has to do a lot of things to argue that um, money is, the absence of money is not a form of not having negative liberty. He argues that money is a characteristics like height. Uh, if you don't have the height to, you know, slam dunk a basketball, you're not unfree. You just don't happen to have that ability. And he argues money should be understood as that, the quantity that you have. And we'll talk about that more in a minute. Uh, and I think a lot of people, that, that idea was always a little hard, but then it was joined by this other development, which was the real ascendancy of economics as a language and thought of elite policymaking. Uh, it's tough to know now, but up until the 1930s, certainly economists did not play the role um, that they did in American society. Um, they and, and their formulas and their assertions didn't necessarily have the force that it did after Great Depression, World War II. There's a lot of histories to be written about this. Um, there's a, a great book coming out next year, Thinking Like an Economist, by I think Beth Poppins, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on her name, a sociologist who talks about the ascendancy of economics in the 1960s and 70s, which I think is really, really important. But this notion that you see in a lot of different ways, ways efficiency is written into the laws as a, as a goal, as opposed to something that just happens to exist and may or may not be good, or a, a generic characteristic as opposed to a form of freedom. But there, economists have a very specific thing about how people should be interacting with markets, which is to say the government should structure markets to be like an economics textbook, and then get out of the way and not care whether or not people have access to things, and to the extent they're worried about it, give people money. So as uh, James Tobin described the view of people like this, his fellow economists in the 1970s, uh, let me find the good quote on this. Well, uh, this is the quote, while concerned laymen who observe people with shabby housing or too little to eat instinctively want to provide them with decent housing and adequate food, economists instinctively want to provide them with more cash income. Um, and this idea that get, you know, enforce the market and then just kind of provide people ways to interact with the market, be it by giving them just cash or by giving them skills and training, um, became very predominant. Uh, the philosopher Michel Foucault describes, in, describes this kind of idea in his lectures about what would be described as neoliberalism is, um, you know, he, he describes the purpose of a basic income would be socially effective without being economically disruptive. But it also means giving up on the idea that society as a whole owes services like health and education to each of its members. And you see this kind of idea kind of percolate through. And the book is meant for a general audience. It's worthwhile to take a, a quick theory break for a second here. The book is meant for a general audience, so it does not talk a lot about advanced theories of neoliberalism. But I think it's important to talk a little bit about what I mean by it. Um, and I think... I think there are two essential things people should take away from the literature as general readers. And we can talk in Q&A about more specific things. But one is that neoliberalism is an affirmative state project to carry out a particular vision of the economy. To the extent that people talk about free markets or unfettered markets uh, or getting government out of the way or a small government even, they're essentially in an ideological fog or they might even be lying. Um, Neoliberalism, the, the era, the stage of capitalism over the last 40 years carried out by a, a network of people has been an affirmative state project to structure markets so that they are um, shielded from democratic accountability and that they do a bunch of things that they carry out the market in such a way that is less democratic uh, and that functions more like an economics textbook. It does a bunch of other things too we can talk about depending on the thing, but it is not just let's get out, let's let's stop doing things. Because in many places such as globalization, such as um, 
intellectual property laws and the nature of a corporation as in the financial sector, it often uses the state to enhance or give more powers or do more things for businesses. Um, it actively structures markets in a, in a way that is based on a theory of freedom, but freedom for owners and, and wealth and claim holders and bosses uh, and the freedom to engage in market activity. And here I um, benefit from the Marxist historian, Ellen Wood, who describes the concept called market dependency. And, we, and I've hit this back and forth with the book about the, the question isn't markets. Uh, markets have been around for centuries, millennia. Uh, we will, no matter what happens after capitalism, we will almost certainly be trading things and perhaps even trading things for currency. The question is about how dependent we are on markets. Because while markets can provide a kind of freedom, like it opens up opportunities for people, being dependent on the market, the ability to buy and sell things for survival, to meet our needs, to meet our health, to educate ourselves, to survive, creates a dependency that is a form of unfreedom. And so it's a question of how we democratically balance that. And I think that understanding it in terms of market dependency, not, I don't know if you see these memes online where it's like, well, how can you criticize society? You have an iPhone or how, you know, can you criticize tech? You're on a computer or something like that. But that's like not really the question. The real question is how dependent we are on markets to structure the basic necessities of life and the ways we interact with each other. And I think when we are dependent on markets, that introduces an important uh, form of unfreedom. The second takeaway from the neoliberalism literature I really want people to, to know is that um, this isn't just about policies that create a certain kind of economic outcome or market, but also a kind of citizenship. Uh, and you can get really abstract with this pretty quick, but just on a practical level. So the book here talks, uh, uh, one of the chapters is about um, the creation of the student loan, which had to basically be created in the 1970s and uh, its structure that it is now. It's evolved quite a bit over law. But you know, for centuries, it was understood that um, as part of a civic responsibility that the state should provide free public higher education. Uh, it's in the Indiana Charter. It's, you know, there and it's often has very strong language. Obviously, the, the Wisconsin ideal and the creation of the Wisconsin state system. Um, you know, this has a long history, but starting for a variety of reasons, uh, in part because it was opened to not just white men starting in the 1950s and 60s, there was a real effort to clamp it down in the 1970s. And that wasn't just about saying like, who's going to pay for college or what's the relationship going to be? The people who articulated really did believe that they can make people um, different in college. So like if you need student loans to pay for your education, you will have a different relationship with the state and you'll have a different relationship with yourself and the economy. And I think that does actually pan out and, and, empirical studies that find that people who have more student debt have to take jobs that pay more instead of doing um, perhaps less remunerative, but perhaps more socially desirable work. And it also changes the nature of, of what people can expect of, of their state governments, of, their, of, of the government more, more broadly. Um, and with that in mind, as that stuff, but freedom through markets is incomplete. And you know, going through a history, the book is a history, and I'll talk, talk about why in a second it was pretty clear that there's about five good reasons that I found that keep showing up throughout history uh, about why um, markets can cause unfreedom just as much as freedom. And I'm gonna walk through them. So the first is just the most straightforward. The distribution of goods in a market economy doesn't match what we need to lead, live free lives. Health, education, and time are part of the necessary baseline for exercising our freedom. And as such, it is necessary that all of us have it, access to them in some roughly equal measure. These goods should not be distributed on the basis of who can afford to pay for them. As uh, uh, Bertrand Williams, a, a philosopher once described, you know, the, the proper basis for healthcare is people who are sick, not people who are sick and also happen to have money. Second argument is that the market is unreliable provider of essential goods. Sometimes companies just don't produce enough compared to what society needs. People demand free public college because it was clear that private higher education institutions would rather increase their prestige instead of providing mass education, a problem that was well known in the 19th century. Insurance companies want to preemptively discriminate against those who would most benefit from insurance. And simply subsidizing private businesses to do this work can easily end up with them capturing those resources rather than providing what is needed. Uh, public programs here would do the opposite, reducing costs, ensuring people get what they need. This is a big argument for Medicare for all. In addition, while any individual market for a good can fail to deliver what society needs, the problem is compounded when you look at how all those markets put together can fail during recessions and depressions. 
The problem of insufficient demand created long periods of high unemployment and depressed output for no reason other than the failure of the market to coordinate all of its activities. An important reason people have demanded protections from the marketplace to offset this devastation caused by the business cycle, pay no individual causes themselves or could prevent on their own. Markets that can collapse in such ways are not suitable for the core elements of our freedom. And we saw this quite a bit in the past year where absent um, strong government intervention and in unemployment insurance, basic checks, uh, eviction uh, delays, and many other strong interventions, the pandemic uh, and the lockdowns have been far more devastating to people. But in actuality, we saw poverty fell during the second and third quarter, certainly did not increase. I think there's some debate about this, but uh, for unemployment going to 20%, for us to have a technical depression for a brief period of time and have poverty not increase and maybe even fall uh, is remarkable. It shows that things like poverty are a choice and we can even stand up against them against some of the hardest times that we've seen with very minimal cost to society, if anything. The third argument, and I think this one's a little bit more in the philosophy camp, is that the freedom requires being free from the arbitrary power and domination by the will of others. Americans have concluded that if others can interfere with your life in a wanton and capricious manner, you are not free. The marketplace is a site of profound domination and arbitrary power. It's obvious in the labor contract and the abstract worldview of economists, workers simply buy their labor and or workers simply sell their labor and buy and bosses buy it the same way one might sell and buy a pack of gum. But the workplace has always been one of the most important political battlegrounds for the definition of freedom. Workers put themselves under what the philosopher Elizabeth Anderson describes as the private government of bosses in the workplace. And these relationships, like any kind of government power, can be predatory and exploitative. While workers may have the choice to leave, many don't, either because they lack viable options in a larger economic environment or the terms of the contracts themselves. Bosses will always have an advantage because under market dependency, workers need to work in order to survive, in order to have the resources to continue living. Uh, and you know, our abuse of arbitrary power extends from the labor contract to markets in general. Consider uh, financial companies manipulating energy prices or pharmaceutical investors taking over and manipulating IP to prevent people from getting needed drugs. Consider exploited a financial crisis, uh, uh, financial credit products. The philosopher Deborah Satz describes these kinds of exchanges as noxic, noxious markets. Markets like these can create harmful outcomes for individual members themselves or for society as a whole. They're characterized by an asymmetry of both knowledge and power. And people have always fought to suppress these kinds of markets in order to preserve their freedom. The fourth argument is the, far, the fourth argument against market dependency is that the expansion of markets to all of society turns all things into commodities and leaves no reward for those things that don't function as commodities. As the political economist Karl Polanyi described in his book, The Great Transformation, things like land, labor, and money aren't actual commodities. Instead, each function is a fictitious commodity. Land isn't produced by anyone. It was already there. Money isn't made from one's efforts, but comes from banks and states as a me mechanism for accounting. Polanyi writes, labor is only another name for human activity which goes with life itself, and which in turn is not produced for sale, but for entirely different reasons, nor can the activity be detached from the rest of life, be stored or mobilized. Society resisted the commodification of all these elements, be it um, free land, working uh, limitations on working hours, or democratic control of money, Understanding something was being stripped from the marketplace when they were determined solely by the market was a form of unfreedom. Um, sustaining human life requires resources that the market can't guarantee. Uh, under capitalism, you need to secure market wages in order to survive. But those who can't work, either because they are old, young, or disabled, or caregiving, uh, still need to survive. A society based entirely around the market will not be able to reproduce itself in a healthy manner because all societies rely on an infrastructure of care to replenish itself. People aren't batteries that can be recharged in a factory. They're human beings who need care, love, and protection in order to function. Society needs resources to raise and care for children, work that doesn't claim any income from society. This care work of social reproduction is precisely, the thing the mark, precisely a thing the market doesn't pay for. It can only borrow against it till the deficit run starts to strain us all. The last reason people have given for why freedom requires a suppression of the market is that contrary to the idea of negative freedom, the marketplace is a political project, a form of government that projects state power. Once you think of how a modern capitalist economy operates, the idea of negative freedom doesn't carry any weight. Just as we debate whether or not the actions of the government will help or hinder freedom, the execution of the marketplace by the government needs to be democratically debated as well. 
There's no neutral way to have a market and all choices matter, especially when it comes to how free we are. Money and property are the terms under which we manage relationships among people. Those relationships are backed by the state, which ultimately enforces all contracts. This can be a little abstract. So start, consider, for example, owning a house. You own your house because you can prevent other people from living in it or using it without your permission. It is not a vertical relationship between you and the physical structure. Your house remains blissfully unaware of any legal contract you have over it, and you can't really talk with it to make it work better, as I've been finding with some of our home repair issues. <laughs> Instead, it's a horizontal relationship between people. If you were to sleep on the front porch of someone else's house, they could call the police to remove you. This is even more true in a modern economy where the state structures capital and wealth claims so they can easily be moved across time and space. From shares in a corporation intellectual to intellectual property, much of what constitutes wealth in our era doesn't reflect relationships to actual objects, but instead, re instead represents claims over profits and incomes, claims the government will ultimately administer. Once you see property in this sense, we understand that there's no way in which it can be defined as anything other than a form of regulating interference among people. So the reason I st structured this book as a history is because I, I write a lot of policy papers and I write a lot of um, arguments explaining various things in market interventions, but I thought that history might be able to open up a few different things. First was that it gives us a sense that these battles have been fought before. I think one thing about our era is that it kind of precludes the possibility of change and precludes the possibility that we can overcome our obstacles and build a better and new world. And so each chapter walks through a different battle, the, uh, the Homestead Act and the Southern Homestead Act, the eight hour workday, the battle over social insurance, um, the New Deal uh, and the Wagner Act and social security, um, public daycares during World War II, the desegregation of Southern hospitals executed through the expansion of Medicare or the creation of Medicare, uh, and then the rollback, be it um, the imposition against stripping the public out of the public corporation, the public utility and the public domain, and the imposition of student loans into free higher public education. And I think each of those show a different battle over a different sphere of our lives. And each of those battles has a real potential um, that they all still hang with us in some ways today, even though some of them are very directly related like control over working hours and some of them more abstractly, like what do we do with our nation's wealth? Um, and I think trying to tie those in together, I think was one of the, the key goals of, of this book. And so much time do I have left at this point? Uh, it was 105, 25, so I have 15 minutes left. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit. So, um, you know, so the, I think of uh, the right way to approach this. So the, um, even starting with something as well-known as the Homestead Act, which is I think one of the, I saw Polo as like one of the most well-known bills. Um, and something I went back and forth about whether to talk about, because obviously white supremacy, colonialization, genocide covered the whole thing. But it, looking at it through this question of market dependency, you can kind of open up a couple of different things. Well, first is that um, talking, the way people were talking about wealth and the direction of the economy before industrialization is really eye-opening. There's a language around this stuff that I think predates the development of capitalism that is really interesting and worth thinking through and even trying to reclaim. During the question of the eight hour workday in, in that chapter, I talk about a fight in Boston over um, a 10 hour workday in 1820, I think, in the 1820s. And they use language that is um, Republican in the philosophical sense of, you know, people have you know, rights, they're, they're the children of the revolution, they can't be compelled by bosses to work hours they don't want to. Uh, and it's uh, very telling, very unique. And it's being recaptured in its own way in the fight for 15 and the fight, the, the strike wave we are living through right now, though it's, I don't think it's acknowledged as such. Um, you know, these, these periods of very intense things are trying to reclaim a language. And I think the book tries to pull that forward a little bit. Um, I think, you know, seeing the social nature of property and the way settler colonialism really does lay bare that the state is enforcing these contracts. And there's a real open fight about whether or not um, land in the West will go to the expansion of slavery or the expansion of homesteads. And third um, is, this is a book about how political ideas change. And talking about, talking about the Homestead Act allows you to talk about reconstruction because there's a Southern Homestead Act, which failed. Uh, and it failed in part, in large part, because white Northerners did not want to redistribute land. It failed in large part because 
the linking of economic rights and civil rights, one of the key issues we steal, we, uh, key issue, a key problem for reconstruction for the New Deal, key problem for our current era, um, precludes it from working. And as such, it, it helps lead to the collapse of reconstruction by waning Northern support. And seen in the, the chapter talks about Horace Greeley is how he becomes a strong opponent of the expansion of slavery to uh, a defender of, of what would become or a person opposed to reconstruction. Um, and it's a, it's a sad thing to see people's ideas not evolve in a period in which ideas need to evolve rapidly for human society and also for the planet. Um, I think another thing that I think was really interesting that stands out a lot, especially at this specific moment, is people talk about, as we may be legislating a very large change in care labor, are New Deal uh, World War II daycares. And to me, this is um, a, just a very fascinating story, which I knew a little bit about, but um, really getting to understand it better was, I think, really helpful and really useful. But essentially, um, you, hold on, I'm going to pull up some quotes from it. Um, So with the war, uh, the number of women in the labor force jumped by over half. Uh, employment grew from 27 to 37 percent, six, six and a half million new workers. Number of working women went from 12 million to 18 million. It's a huge revolution in the types of jobs women had, of course, it was even more important. Um, and so there's all these women and mothers going into the workforce for the total mobilization of society. And the question of day, daycares come up and, uh, you know, like, should the public provide daycares? And for the purposes of war mobilization, um, men in Congress uh, said, yes, we, we absolutely will use these funds to institute daycares. And there's becomes a huge battle over, uh, over, over the nature of that. And uh, many groups are opposed to the Catholic Church. Uh, interestingly enough, the daycare workers, uh, the, the, I'm sorry, the, um, the social worker community is also reluctant. On. I'll talk about why in a second. Um, and there's this like bidding war among centers about how quickly they can stop it. And uh, these universal daycares, which are widely used, uh, exist uh, for about a year after the war. And women who were using them and other women really fought <coughs> the federal government and state governments to keep them going. They ultimately failed. Only California kept it going with a means test. But it, in the book documents, it's a really interesting political fight because it shows how the market can't solve this, but it also shows how the government can solve it. And quite rapidly, these things were put together in essentially a year uh, as a result of, of their actions. And um, it's very interesting to see it in the context of the program design that's happening around pre-K daycare uh, and, and several other, and, and the child tax credit and other things in, in social reproduction policy being debated right now. Um, in the right way to describe this. There's a real question about whether or not these are, are to use the terminology now means tested or whether or not they're only given essentially as a form of poverty policy, which is how any form of, of voluntary charity-based daycare was uh, being delivered at that time period. And the social worker community actually wanted like case files. They wanted anyone who used them to have to interact with the social worker, to have to kind of get clearance, to be approved as being worthy, uh, having to be subject to income and wealth tests, and generally a kind of humiliating battery of, 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 question, of, of seeing whether or not someone is worthy of these programs. And the US military had absolutely no interest in this. They wanted bombers, not case files. They did not want to play amateur social worker. So the U US military essentially provides this universal daycare system. Um, they oversee it. They actually take pretty strong control away from the other parts of the bureaucracy that would have been more tied to having it be more poverty related. And, you know, like there's, there's a small fee. Um, <coughs> sorry, excuse me. There's a small fee. Let me get the, um, at its height, there were 3,102 centers providing care for close to 130,000 children. This is put together within a year. Uh, you think about how um, the government often works these days and how much it can work when it needs to do something. Uh, the, you know, over, and so 130,000 children at any moment, overall about 600,000 children received care through the centers at some point. Um, you know, many were improvisational because you know, so many resources are being deployed, but some of them are quite remarkable. There's one at the Kaiser Center um, day, um, at, um, in uh, California where they're 24 hours, uh, come and go. Uh, there's, health, you know, there's some health providing, there's 
food. Um, there's a lot of other supplementary things that becomes a real center that is kind of seen that could be a, a model for the future. Unfortunately, it collapses uh, afterwards and it collapses into um, the submerged state. Um, <coughs> I want to read from a thing here. Let me get it. As the programs are being pulled back in the aftermath of World War II, um, there's a couple, uh, Lilith Smith and her husband, um, who try to deduct the private cost of their, their nursemaid, their, their, their daycare worker, as a business expense. This is 1937. And to generalize quickly, uh, in tax law, especially at the time, you can deduct a, you can deduct something if it is a business success, business expense and service of market income, but you can't deduct, deduct something that is personal, that is for personal living or family expenses. So there's this question about whether or not daycare is part of the economy or part of the personal sphere. And this is a really important distinction because we'll, the New Deal, however tenuously, rips open the, the nominally private sphere of the workplace and institutes the basis of some accountability, some form of democracy in the Wagner Act and unionization, some form of protection and in social insurance and social security. And it's complicated and deeply compromised and unfinished, but it is understood that that is a, that is a wall that has been pierced. Uh, that's a veil that has been pierced. Um, when it comes to the other nominally private structure, the household, that doesn't happen the same way. Uh, even though households, um, the way they exist, the way they function, how healthy and strong they are, strongly determined by the economy and the government environment around it, whether or not there are strong jobs, whether or not there are protections, whether or not the whole thing is, is just as much a political construction as the workplace. Um, the key element here, though, is that when it comes to providing for households, and care work in the aftermath of World War II, we do not go with this public daycare solution. We instead go with private tax credits. So when this claim for a tax credit comes before the Board of Tax Appeal, the board um, has to decide if caring for children was a personal decision or responsibility outside the world of work, uh, in which case it would not count as a deduction, or it has to decide if it was a, a public thing, something that was, you know, uh, essential to carrying out economic activity and expense like an entity like a business would face. The, bo the board chose private as a tax rule, and you often find that these like administrative agencies make so many important decisions that are key for, for freedom. And their decision in 1939 was, we are not prepared to say that the care of children, like similar aspects of family and household life, is other than a personal concern. The wife services a custodian of the home and protector of its children uh, are ordinarily rendered without monetary compensation. The results, they, there results no taxable income from the performance of the service. <coughs> in other words, the board ruled that caregivers, wives and mothers in this case, were not laborers and their work was not working in an economic sense. And that's obviously wrong. And it's obviously false. And it became harder to keep that illusion going on in the mid-century period. So as a result, um, in order to try to circumvent this, they, Congress in the 1954 tax bill, um, which reworks a lot of the, the tax at the time, they create a tax credit for daycare. And this thing evolves, involves, involves. It's, it's a bunch of different things at different times. And now it's a pretty expansive tax credit um, that allows for people to, if they pay out of pocket, to deduct it from their taxes. Very similar to how healthcare works for employers. In fact, it's 1954 bill that creates that as well as a partially as a bulwark against um, socialized medicine or, or what would now be called Medicare for all. And as a result, you have this private system that benefits those with more money because the tax deductions is worth a lot more to people with more money. The average value um, is significantly higher um, of, of how much people claim and how often they claim it with these things. And second, it creates a, um, Susan Mettler describes it as a submerged welfare state. Other phrases are hidden, divided, delegated, <coughs> in which um, the actual social insurance system is hidden from public view and thus public accountability by working through these tax credits and private providers. And as a result, it's hard to organize around. People don't even understand that they receive a government program or that, that, that there is all this government scaffolding holding these things together. And it makes it harder to actually make the benefit beneficial and universal and people able to access it. And that's one of the key things we're still seeing now with the debates going on over what is uh, the reconciliation bill, the Build Back Better bill, 
um, there's a pretty strong debate about whether or not these programs should, what should be the public private division of them, how universal they should be, whether or not there should be work requirements. And ultimately those are debates about market dependency and how much we will be dependent on the market for these key goods in our lives versus how much we will suppress the extent of the market and ensure that the actual service is delivered. And so um, with that, I wanna wrap it up with those examples of, of how market dependency plays out in our conversations and open up for questions. All right, well, there's a lot to, to think about there. And I'm sure that a lot of people have questions. So the, the way we're gonna proceed is as follows. I'm sure that a lot of people are familiar with this if you've attended other talks of ours. We're gonna take a couple of questions at a time. Um, and so there are two ways to do that. One is that if you go to the bottom of, well, both of these, at the bottom of your screen, there's a menu at the far right, you can see reactions. If you click on that and then uh, raise your hand, that'll alert me that you wanna ask a question or make a comment. If you're shy about doing that, you can use the chat function, the third from the left, and just write out a question or comment, and then I can read it out loud for everybody's benefit. So. Um, we can begin to take a stack now, a cue. So um, don't be shy. Please weigh in. Well, um, here's here we go. So Samantha says, would someone add, oh, a concise reiteration of the five arguments against market dependency? Um, all right. right. Let's, let's hold off on that maybe. Um, in the absence of another question, we might be able to go to that. Um, let, let me ask you a question, which is to elaborate a bit on this whole debate around universality. I mean, it's, I mean, you made reference, for example, to Esping Anderson. And one of the arguments, if I remember from that book correctly, and that's certainly been made by others, that one of the successes, especially of say Scandinavian welfare states is universality, that everybody had a stake in them and that made them much more politically viable. And that seems to be clearly um, on the agenda of those who want the most robust version of this um, bill that's currently held up in Congress. Um, whereas the holdouts, cinema and mansion want it to be more means tested. Um, do you wanna say more about that? Uh, applying what you've been talking about to this current debate? Yeah, absolutely. So um, there's a couple different dimensions on why universality um, is better and more universal is better at the margins. Uh, even if we're gonna deal with the world in which these things are means tested or otherwise clipped on accessibility. Um, one is that there's an administrative simplicity with things being universal. Um, the, the fully refundable child tax credit, which was introduced at the American Rescue Plan in March, is having a hard time hitting a lot of the poorest um, families in our country, in part because being a tax credit in that way means you have to have filed taxes. Uh, which many families do not do. It uh, means you have to basically be up on your paperwork in a way that a lot of families might not. Um, it means it 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 is easier to it it harms people who have more volatile income or harder to predict income because it's hard to understand the the value of the benefit uh, and may actually end up making it um, slightly more onerous on middle class families who have large income boosts. Um, where if it was just a like here is you know, $500 a month to every family with a child or $300 a month with, to every family with a child, period. And then we'll deal with the taxes later through general taxes, uh, as opposed to trying to balance this. There's, there's a real benefit to that. Um, and I think that's quite important um, to, to keep in mind. Um, obviously it's cheaper if it's means tested, but it's not always that much cheaper because, you know, um, you see these arguments like uh, Medicare, for instance, you know, rich people don't necessarily purchase a lot more health care, especially through Medicare than everyday people. So if you cut out the top 5%, you're only saving 5%, which is not necessarily a lot of money, uh, especially if that causes a political vulnerability. Um, the, and I think the, the administrative point is often underlooked and I think very underappreciated. 
Um, there's a lot of theories about how it builds support. I find those generally compelling and that programs that are particularly designed for the poor tend to be poor programs and its administration and their political success. There's a lot of back and forth about how true that is. And I think a lot of it has to do with the sphere of life in question. In general, people are much more open for poor children. Um, but I, I think for the things we're talking about, especially if you're talking about pre-K, especially if you're talking about daycares, things that have an administrative complexity and that all benefit from larger societal buy-in uh, among all families, not just poorest families, um, I think the administrative, I, I think the argument for a more expansive version of it is very important. And I think you're starting to see doing fewer things better seems to be where the Democrats are, are heading towards with the bill, which is unfortunate that it's going to be as clipped as it is because there's, I think, at its core, a very profound vision of how to compensate care work, how to address lack of infrastructure investment over decades and how to finally start to deal with climate. And I, I hope we get the more expansive version than the smaller one, though, obviously, the, the negotiations are continuing on on the Hill. All right, thanks for that. So a couple of questions, one in the chat, brief one, I'll read out and then turn to somebody who's raised his hand. Uh, from Greg, uh, do you think that universal basic income would be a good direction to go in? And then we've got a question from uh, Barry Eidlin, who's who can speak for himself. Hi there. Um, thanks for that great presentation, Mike. Uh, I'm a big fan of your work. Um, and I've got a lot of things I could talk about, but I have a very specific question related to this broader discussion of universality, which is sort of to have you respond to a criticism that often get has been, I've been seeing raised, particularly around the expansion of, of unemployment benefits and that these sort of expansion of, that when you expand benefits, and make them more universal that it opens up the door for more, uh, you know, for more waste and corruption, basically. So, so that so there's all the stories about people sort of filing fraudulent claims and and, and that kind of stuff, and that that this sort of um, that that this is sort of the the moral hazard, I guess, of 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 creating these bigger government programs. So, so I would like to hear you. I mean, I obviously have some thoughts about that, but I'd like to hear your response. Yeah, absolutely. So um, uh, to Greg's question about universal basic income, and you'll, um, if you end up in these spaces, you'll see these fights all the time about, should you give people cash or should you give people services? And I, I think it's often situated as a false kind of dichotomy or a, a false choice. Um, I think when you're thinking about giving people cash, you want to ask the question is, is the, how is this in a broader context either increasing or decreasing market dependency. And I think that's why I really like Ellen Wood's description of market dependency is, is a kind of like North Star here to really understand if we're getting closer or further away. So some people like uh, Milton Friedman, the libertarian economist, um, and many other people on the conservative uh, libertarian side um, like a basic income because they then say you can get rid of other things. So like have a basic income, but then get rid of Medicare or get rid of Medicaid is a big one. And uh, which is this argument that you know give people give people some cash, but then make them far more dependent on things like markets, make them far more dependent on markets for things like healthcare and education that markets are very bad at providing, and people, especially vulnerable people, are are, are very subject to predation. And, and that I think is a bad argument for universal basic income, and that takes us further away. However, if we understand that there are points in our life where we just can't secure income. Uh, we're children, we're caregiving. That's an argument for basic income for families, for children, which a refundable tax credit, if well-designed and executed and extended, as I hope it is, is kind of like a basic income for families. And there, I think it's really appropriate because um, families have a lot more expenses than with, with children than without children. And you want to normalize and equalize that kind of income. And also caregiving and raising children is just work that is essential that is not compensated and is not just we should understand as a personal choice or a hobby and their the argument for basic income as pushing back against market dependency i think is really important um, you see some people who say we really like the child tax credit because it will help prevent um, the call for uh, universal daycares but that's a bad argument but that's not necessary in fact if anything i think creating more support for families opens up the door for more things. So that's a political and strategic decision, but I do think that that helps us understand things. So, you know, when uh, I think Andrew Yang 
uh, when he was running in the, the primary in 2020, talked a lot about a basic income, talked a lot about getting rid of waste and fraud. And it's been a while, but if you looked at those numbers, they only kind of made sense if you got rid of Medicaid, which is health care for uh, poor people and families that was expanded up into working class people under the uh, Affordable Care Act. And that I think is a pretty bad trade-off um, to take away people's health care and say, here's, here's some money, good luck. <clears throat> and it's a, kind of a false choice. So I think sometimes universal basic income arguments are a little forced into dichotomies that aren't helpful, but instead we should understand that we need to get cash to people who are unemployed. We need to get cash to people who are caregiving or disabled or students or otherwise engaged in important things that aren't market bearing, that don't bear market incomes. Uh, and we saw a lot of cash go out the door last year, arguably you know, six trillion, depending on how you want to count them, uh, including you know, you know, unemployment checks, we'll talk about more in a second, that I think were a massive sign for a more humane and democratic account uh, economy that didn't just serve to kind of like sneak in libertarian ideas. So I always think of it in the broader context. And I think that's a very important discussion. As for uh, Barry's comment um, or, or question, yeah, that's that's a question. Um, you know, the book talks at length about the courts and the court, the Supreme Court in particular's role in enforcing market dependency and how, you know, the Lochner decision we don't often remember is um, uh, struck down a maximum hours law, right? Which is like, you know, like the control over time, control over our time. That's like one of the hearts of market dependency in the 19th century going into the, the New Deal. And the Supreme Court just wipes it down at the state level, no less. <coughs> Sorry, a little six, I'm coughing. Um, and one thing that happens with the creation of our, long way of saying, uh, one thing that happens with the creation of our unemployment insurance system is that, you know, the creators of the social, uh, of the social security system, which UI is part of, um, are terrified that the Supreme Court is going to strike it down. This is before FDR stands down the courts, before the 36 election, which is a way for FDR that people argue why the Supreme Court decided to go with the New Deal, whether or not FDR stood them down, whether it was wave election, whether it was other things. But in 34, when they're starting, 34, 35, when they're creating the outline of what becomes Social Security, they're terrified that the Supreme Court is going to kill it. And so they make unemployment insurance a state-based system. They might have done this anyway because of federalism, because of a bunch of other things, but they certainly do it in their own writings is because they're like, if the Supreme Court strikes down Social Security, which we are terrified, which we are nervous that it's going to happen, that they might let UI exist as state programs. And they didn't strike it down. Um, the Supreme Court did not strike it down. But, you know, flash forward 80 years later, and we have a system of unemployment insurance that's a mess. Um, a lot of different states with a lot of states purposefully letting these UI systems become negligent or, or just, just become in disarray, either actively cutting them down, actively working to discourage people from using them, actively making them so they can't be used well, but also just not keeping up with them and letting them kind of fall apart. So you do have a lot of people having problems accessing U of I, and you do probably have some fraud. Now, not the numbers that are being claimed by security experts. I think some of these numbers are insane and it's irresponsible people sharing them in the press, but that's all other story. Um, but we're still fighting. And now we have a whole new ultra right court to deal with. <laughs> and we're still trying to like deal with the legacy of the last one. That's the reason why like UI, I don't think was as popular as it should have been because there's a lot of legitimate problems in getting it even after a few months when it got stood up though it did get a lot of money to a lot of people very quickly. So I think, you know, the structure, you can structure things in ways that are bad that invite corruption, but in general, and I certainly think at the margins, broader, more accessible and more clearly transparent and democratic things are hard to be abused. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna use abuse uh, and, and hard to be misallocated. I don't wanna just say like uh, abuse, but like, you know, one thing I think about a lot is the minimum wage versus the earned income tax credit, which is a, a wage subsidy of, of sorts meant to, re meant to replace the minimum wage starting in the 1980s and 90s. And, you know, a lot of, I think about a third of people who are eligible for the EITC don't claim it. Um, because the process is too complicated, because there, there's a lot of arguments for why this happens, but you know, it's it's a non-trivial thing to get, where the minimum wage is like hard not to get unless there's an actual act of fraud by the employer, and there your recourse is at least clearly obvious, even if it's tough to enact legally, right? So it's like, 
minimum wage is $15. Are you being paid $15? Where your EITC should supplement your income four grand, but you know, did you know that? When did you get it? And all these complicated things. So there's an administrative simplicity about the minimum wage that prevents misallocation in the way that a lot of these more clever and submerged government programs don't. And so that that really jumps out at me. And you know, the best way to have a program that have a lot of problems with it is just to have it administered well. And programs that have bigger buy-in, I think, tend to be administered better. That that's how I, I generally approach it. Um, yeah. That's a good question. All right. So we've got a couple of more questions in the chat. One from Samantha who asks, are the impositions of market forces, i.e. political contributions, campaign finance, song reform, the key obstacle to universal social programs? And then Michael asks, you mentioned the importance of technocracy and treating problems like markets to neoliberalism. As someone interested in policy analysis, which draws heavily on textbook microeconomics, do you see a viable alternative to analyzing policy outside a market and efficiency maximizing framework? Yeah, those are fantastic questions. So, you know, what is the key obstacle right now? Probably not having more senators. That's probably the key obstacle right now in a brass tax way. Um, obviously, campaign finance is a, an important issue. Um, I think. I think there's people who argue that campaign finance is becoming less of a problem for egalitarian politics. I don't, I don't know if that's true or not. That's not my world. But um, the big thing right now, I think, is just the, I mean, speaking politically for a second, just that you you have a conservative party that can now win with 40, that can wield power with 45, 48% of the vote. And I don't, in a consistent way, not in a way that's just like weird off elections in the 19th century. And our democracy is not meant to handle this. Um, this was obviously true of Jim Crow in its era and white supremacy, but now it's playing out into national institutions and things like the Supreme Court and the Senate, which amplify that quite a bit. And that makes me genuinely worried. And so I, I hope that broad-based economic reforms can help make an, a, a good pitch for for voters, though it is hard work and complicated by, as you point out, campaign finance and you know the very powerful pull of industry and is both money and also intellectually um, in in turning centrist off a lot of the really key and, and popular. It's a whole debate about this um, reform. So that jumps out at me is the thing that has me up at night is the anti democratic impulse built into the electoral college in the senate and how um it's really going to mess with our institutions in a way we have not seen in a long time in ways that i think conventional political theory is not well suited to deal with uh, which is very depressing but that's that's my answer uh, as for someone interested in policy analysis man this is a great question and i don't know if i have a great answer to it one is that administration matters, technocracy matters, right? Like I actually don't super like the word technocracy because I understand what people mean by it, but sometimes I feel it ends up meaning administration, like just having a functioning bureaucracy and having a functioning bureaucracy that can make administrative decisions using technical knowledge is super important. Like the actuaries who run social security administration are technocrats and they use a lot of complicated formulas and they have fancy degrees and um, to figure out like how much social security is going to pay out and how to do the inflation adjustments and how to keep the thing rolling. And that's fantastic because you need de technocracy to make a genuinely democratic program work <laughs> like the actual nut, like the, the guts of it, like that requires technical knowledge. Um, same thing. If we had Medicare for all, there would be a lot of technocrats there like figuring out the correct way to pay for a knee, knee replacement uh, and other forms of medical interventions that technocracy would move out of the insurance companies into the government and the government would have much more pricing power to compel which would be great in holding down costs and, and increasing access but that would still be technical knowledge in, in, the, in, in a strict sense um what i think so i study policy analysis it's super important you gotta you gotta know the numbers you gotta do the things i think the problem is, is when the efficiency and the, the arguments of technocracy become the moral vision, 
is when it becomes this kind of like self-referential loop that eats itself and causes a lot of problems. And you see this even among non-ideologically committed people who are in the space who are not hard libertarians or even people with, with strong ideological priors about the role of the state, but like, hey, like efficiency is good and if this program, and so now I'm not gonna judge it strictly on this efficiency thing or like cost benefit analysis is neutral, which it's not. Therefore, like we got, if, if something doesn't pass cost benefit analysis, even though there's these insane arguments baked into it, then it's a bad program. And I think making better technical arguments is actually really important and also having the moral compass of the world you want to build, be it a world with, with less market dependency, among other arguments, um, I think is really key and important. So that, that's how I would approach that dynamic, though. Um, and I hope everyone checks out the book, but you in particular might really benefit because I think the book is also trying to deal with this, this problem. All right, we've got a couple more. Um, one of which is a brief question. I'm not entirely sure how to interpret it, but it says, could you address the postal service? Um, the and then Virginia asks, could a true shared economy, i.e. redistribution of wealth, help to create a much more equitable system is there public openness towards this kind of thing based on your research? Yes, absolutely. The Postal Service, man, I wanted to write a chapter about it. And I wrote something for Boston Review way back when, um, oh, like six years ago. Um, <coughs> excuse me for coughing. Um, Postal Service is neat if you study the early hi history, because it's just like this massive communications infrastructure built. It's like broadband of its era, but like public broadband with like democratic principles built into it. Uh, it's a massive infrastructure investment to build this thing out in the 1790s. And there's a really cool set of arguments. I'm going to blank on the name of the person who wrote it, but I, I wrote a piece for Boston Review if you want to hunt it down. Um, there's these arguments about how administration, as in the administrative state, as in technocrats and bureaucrats making decisions about how to execute programs. We talked about the people, who, the tax lawyers who figured out, who de determined that a child care in 37, 39 was not deductible. You know, the, the, technocratic equivalent, and I think it's good to use the word technocracy here, um, who built the post office in the 1790s, um, incorporated what we would now consider default First Amendment principles, but were not at the time into its creation, which said that you cannot search the mail without a warrant. We cannot look at the contents of the mail, um, that we want to try to be neutral on, on the content of the mail. That comes in later and it comes in complications. There's huge fights, even like many like actual fights about like postage and this huge political campaign about the how democratic should the rate of, of postage be set in a way that would not be dissimilar from big fights about spending in the economy now. Um, but it's it's really interesting. And then later on, when uh, Louis Brandeis uh, argues that there's a right to privacy in the Constitution, we get our what we now just take for granted as a constitutional right to privacy. He actually cites. The post office incorporating this as a basis for it. And so this, this huge public investment of the post office and, and ensuring, and, 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 and yeah, just like the democratic access, if you can get mail to anywhere at a flat rate, um, the equality, the, the leveling it does, I think is super interesting. And the notion that the administrative practice incorporates dem democracy in the sense that like you have a, a reasonable protection against search and seizure of your mail uh, which was not required at the time, uh, and how that builds and builds on itself to create a more robust system of civil rights and protections is really compelling and very cool. And uh, I'll just also plug there's they just announced a postal service, a postal banking experiment, and I'm very excited to see how that goes. It'll be in a couple areas, but um, in an era of deindustrialization and a lot of economic concentration, economic geographic concentration. Everywhere still has a basically functioning post office that it can't say about many other institutions and certainly banks. And so the fact that the post office with its massive footprint could provide banking services to underbanked areas, particularly in areas where there's just not a lot of investment, be it in rural areas, but also urban areas, I think is really cool and compelling and shows like kind of a democratic accountability that you wouldn't get absent it. So I, I can talk way too much about the post service and I hope I didn't overblow a, a simple question. Um, second, could a true shared economy uh, help to create a much more equitable system? Yes, I think that's a good yes. Um, there's, there's a good question about wealth and what we want wealth to do in a society because there's um, a way we could redistribute wealth, air quotes, uh, that just makes everyone kind of a little capitalist, which 
would help with security, right? It's good for people to have cash, they need it for essentials. But I don't know if we necessarily would prefer everyone owns a few more shares in companies versus like people actually have the things that they need to survive and that, or, or firms become more democratic. Like um, there's a little bit of question about wealth versus income and what it's doing to society, but more broadly and more economically uh, egalitarian, a, a less, less economic equality, I think would lead to better political outcomes uh, for sure. Um, public openness, I mean, people are very open to taxing the rich. It's a very popular thing. Um, even, even when it hits the brass tax of politics, like, um, or the messiness of politics, taxing the rich is still very popular. It polls very popular. It makes a lot of sense. Taxing the rich in the form that um, President Biden first addressed, especially during the campaign trail, could do a lot of things. Basically, it could do most everything outside Medicare for all and climate change, but you want to deficit finance climate change anyway. So there's a real better, taxing the rich in general is good, but there's also an egalitarian thing on the other side. Now the question is getting the politics to work because obviously rich people have a lot at stake in their wealth and the, a lot at stake in the intergenerational transfer of their wealth and privilege and are going to fight very hard on it. And we'll know more in a few months if we're at remotely successful in that. All right. Uh, so the queue is currently open, the stack's currently open. So anybody who would li like to weigh in at this point, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, well, no, that was a clapping hand, not a question. From Patrick approves. All right, Patrick also has a question. Sorry, it was supposed to be a raised hand, but also clapping. Um, uh, Mike, in the last couple of weeks, one of the the book that I'm working on right now is on the evolution of uh, social scientific ideas about poverty and inequality in Latin America in the 20th century. So I've been reading the Chilean neoliberals and um, um, it, it's, uh, it's really remarkable in a way how in the context of an open dictatorship, uh, there introduction of market principles into the economy at a, in an extreme way uh, is defended purely in on the grounds of, well, on two grounds. One is on market efficiency and economic growth. And the second is on the moral grounds of expanding liberty that, uh, that you know, introducing a, 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 what they describe as a free market economy is something that, um, is seen as liberty expanding. So they over and over again, describe the Chilean dictatorship as expanding freedom um, because of its implementation of the economic program. Uh, so, I mean, it's an extreme example, but I think that we can see also in the United States that, um, that the language of freedom is often considered to be a, a, a right-wing discourse uh, and a, a discourse which is beneficial to the right associated with the political right, associated with political individualism. Uh, and uh, I wonder, um, you know, I know this is something that you take up in the book, but you know, how you think about uh, recapturing uh, the idea of freedom for a, a, a left that might be more conditioned to respond to language like solidarity or equality, or you know, why, why is it important to to bring freedom into that uh, into that political conversation? Yeah, definitely. That's a that's a great question. Um, the um, I'm just going to dig out from the book here. Um, when the Wagner Act, which is 1935, and it's a central part of the New Deal, and it helps create the le it creates the first national legal environment for unionization at scale, uh, and it's it's the the law under which a third of the country ends up a third of the workers in the country end up unionized uh, at the height of it in, in the 1950s, and as it's passing, uh, it's interesting to see how much they deploy the language of freedom. So. Uh, uh, so Wagner himself, the New York senator who leads the bill as a uh, liberal of the period, uh, without collective bargaining, there would be slavery by contract. Um, the fathers of our nation did not regard freedom of contract as an abstract, and they valued it as a means of ensuring equal opportunities, which cannot be attained where contracts are dictated by the stronger party. Um, the 
the act would, quote, make the worker a free man, end quote. Uh, other, these are other Democrats who supported the bill. Um, any injunction or any law that prevents a man from striking is a law of servitude. And the, that is the principle we have to keep in mind. This is the difference between freedom and servitude. Unless Congress protects the worker, what liberty have they? Liberty to be enslaved, liberty to be crucified under the spread out system, liberty to be worked to death under the speed up system, the liberty to work at charity or wages, and the liberty to work long hours. That is a Democratic uh, senator, uh, House rep from New York. Um, another House member said, as Lincoln freed the Blacks in the South, so the Wagner Connery bill will free the industrial slaves of this country from further tyranny and oppression of their overlords of wealth. That language might be problematic, but um, generally speaking, when it comes to like, you're, you're not hearing that rhetoric today, right? You're, not, you're hearing about you're hearing market language, right? You're hearing like, you know, like our healthcare system has problems and we have to fix the healthcare market. Uh, we have to, uh, you know, th there's problems with this market. We got to fix that market. We got to make capitalism work better. Um, that language of freedom, I think, is really drained out. I think it's a real problem. Um, you know, I, I, there's a practical one, but what I feel is that like, I think it's just important. Like people really do think of freedom as essential for good reasons. Uh, and the notion of freedom is incoherent. I don't think it is naturally right wing or naturally libertarian or laissez faire, uh, but only that it's just, there's been a very successful intellectual and marketing campaign to make it such. And there's very compelling ground to fight underneath there. Second is I, I think freedom in this does not preclude, but it, amplifies other values, be it equality, solidarity. Um, I think having freedom as part of that is very important. I think, and I think it can help amplify that. So it's, um, it's been an interesting fight. And I don't, in the reviews and in, in the conversations I've had, very few people have like really taken it on, though I do know it's a, a tension about it, is that I think some people are very uncomfortable with the language. I also think is one, and then two, the notion, like, more communitarian ideas, I think, also don't have to necessarily be egalitarian or left wing. Um, you know, the book spends a lot of time with uh, voluntary societies, uh, going into the New Deal in particular, and these were um, social uh, social groups, but, but community groups. Um, you know, um, friars, things like that, um, that were pretty widespread, uh, especially among immigrant communities and many others, um, that tried to function as many states and mutual aid societies that would provide services like social insurance, like job opportunities, um, but that were trying to be miniature states, often with the clear message, not always, but often with the clear message that they could do this and the state would not have to do it. Uh, and the state should not do it because they're doing it. And as one historian said, they, they created a no man's land uh, in between individuals and the state saying like, we'll handle this in communities. You know, uh, conservatives, especially under Reagan, described the little platoons of society and how they want to empower the little platoons. This language is a little dated now, though it still shows up sometimes. And by that, they mean that they're not, and this is also in, in libertarian thought, they're not like hard individualists. Um, and I think sometimes the left can kind of parody this and say, well, like, the right just wants like hard individualism and you're on your own, or it's just your family. But I think for some of them, and I think it's even a genuinely felt thing, is that like, oh, no, 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 like communities, church groups local groups, your baseball league, your bowling league, your little town will be able to handle these problems. And as much as community is important, as much as civic society is very important, um, it is no match for the forces of capitalism and, and the devastation and um, sh the sheer chaos that capitalist societies produce by their nature. And you need a ballast against it and you need to take things out of the market to survive it. And so, you know, the language of like, well, like community, like solidarity, that can also have a libertarian-ish edge just as much as freedom can have a right-wing edge and historically often has. So I think these terms are all way more politically up for grabs, especially at a moment like right now um, than is commonly understood, if that's helpful. All right, we've got a couple more questions in the chat. One from Kermit who asks, could you say more about your statement that climate change action should be deficit financed? Some analyses link the climate crisis as inextricably, inextricably caused by the fundamental essence of capitalism and the quote unquote free market. Is that true? And if so, how can we address that? And then Nikki asks, 
Actually, I skipped a question. I'm going to go come back to Nikki in a bit. I see that Greg asked a question before Kermit. The levels of economic inequality are the largest since the 1920s. Could a wealth tax, whether along the lines proposed by Piketty or otherwise, be a part of turning this around? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, as for uh, taxes on the wealthy, I think, yes. I think, l l let's step back for a second about them before we get to the wealth tax. Um, yeah, I mean, taxes on high earners do two things. One is that they raise a lot of revenue. But two is that taxes, I think sometimes you see people talk about like pre and post tax. Um, if you're in policy world, you see this all the time. It's like there's a market income and then there's taxes and then we get the after tax market distribution. And I think that's, uh, well, I don't call people that reactionary, but it ultimately is libertarian in the sense that it's like there's one distribution the economy is set up to produce. And taxes, high taxes on the rich help and we see this across countries and there's, there's a very influential study about this that i think holds up pretty well is that high taxes on the rich so the high top marginal tax rates 70 80 percent on high incomes over a certain threshold uh, of the mid-century period helped compress the pre-distribution of income the um the the um or the pre-tax distribution of income um in part by creating incentives for ceos not to loot their companies if you know if giving your ceo the 10th million dollar uh, if 90% of that is being taxed by the government, you just don't want to give it to them. And since CEOs suddenly have less of an incentive to sharply get as much out of their company as possible, there's a, a general different mindset than the kind of rating corporate CEO that we've seen since the 1980s, since the rates came down. So I think high taxes on the rich just period is good in setting up the economy to work better towards more egalitarian ends and a little less of this cult of the CEO shareholder dominance model that we've seen since. Um, as for taxes on wealth, I think they're incredibly important. I personally, um, this is just me and not speaking for the Rosen Institute, which uh, my employer has written a lot about um, wealth taxes, with various people um, you can read about it on the sites. I get a little, I, I'm very nervous about the Supreme Court right now. And the choice between a wealth tax that is uncertain how the courts would act versus jacking up the rates we already have that touch many of the same things on the wealth side. I would prefer the latter because we eventually have to stare down the Supreme Court, but finding the best territory and the best grounds to do that is good versus things that are a little untested and a little up in the air and things that don't have a history like the wealth tax in the same way, like uh, houses are taxed as wealth. And there, there's arguments uh, against that interpretation, but certainly that, that new variable is a complicated one. That's very specific for the wealth tax. There are very good arguments by constitutional scholars saying that it's clearly um, uh, constitutional, but with the court as it is, um, I'm thinking, uh, strategically about how we want to pick those battles. That said, we're having a hard time getting just baseline good taxes on rich people. There's a lot of ways to tax the rich. They have gotten a lot of the upside since the last 40 years. So they have a lot of wealth to be taxed. Um, and the in intergenerational transfer that's about to happen, I think will cement an oligarchy in a way that is widely underappreciated outside of these simple mechanisms. And so We'll know more in a month or two about what actually survives and what happens in the Build Back Better Reconciliation Bill. But it is worthwhile to note that there are um, more expansive ways and more comprehensive ways, like a wealth tax, like Piketty and uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren has proposed, but also just like basic things like adjusting the ways you can hide money when they transfer generationally would have huge impact. Uh, just even enforcing the law as written, to be honest. Uh, the, the big debate about enforcing uh, funding the IRS at, at proper levels. Would have a huge impact so there's a lot of tools available and um they need to be deployed for, for our democracy and i think for a more equitable economy uh for uh, more about your statement about climate change should be deficit finance so um on the specific question of the financing of a green new deal if you wanted to spend 10 trillion dollars uh over the next 10 years which is what um the Green New Deal uh, are, are you should be spent and a couple other things, uh, Green New Deal adjacent so it should be spent. The best, it is an investment in infrastructure that will pay out over generations. Uh, Kim Stanley Robinson, I think, just talked to her recently. Is that correct? Um, and so, uh, you know, Ministry from the Future, amazing book. You should read it. But the problems are going to be far worse in a few generations and investments we make now, people in a few generations will be happy to have paid them off to have averted climate change. And just in the same way you want to, that, the government is not a household, but in this narrow case, if you're going to put a 
a big addition on your house, you might want to put it on your mortgage because it is an addition with a long-term payout uh, in terms of enjoyment. And this kind of long-term infrastructure spending that is also not permanent, but an investment, so essentially an upgrade to our economy. Uh, deficit finance makes perfect sense for that kind of spending. In addition, interest rates are incredibly low. Um, private financial markets want the government to make, borrow on spending, even through all the chaos of these past two years, even with um, fights about inflation and many other things, even with open-ended deficits for quite some time um, from the Trump tax cuts and many other things, interest rates still re remain dramatically low. Private financial markets really want the government to be doing important things, and this is the most important thing. Um, that, I think, is a question that can be separated from the question of um, uh, to the extent that you need a transition from capitalism or from market economies more generally to deal with climate change. And I, I don't know what um, Kim Stanley Robinson talked about, but in so much as that we need to move now, like right now. Um, if right now is kind of a Keynesian social democracy are the tools that are best available for governments to execute a decarbonization effort, that's where you gotta go with. Um, those are kind of my politics, I'm happy with this, but even if you're more radical like uh, Robinson is, I think there's a sense in which like put the Fed to work, put government deficits to work like Keynes, like do the stuff we can do right now. And you know, to the extent we can continue to build an alternative economy, that's amazing, but um, the more we can do early, the better. Um, you see these a little bit, you know, Degrowth means a lot of things to different people and what a transition from capitalism means, what obviously means a lot of things to very different people. Um, I think right now a strong economic recovery would create the conditions under which we could do the genuine market reallocation away from carbon. If we have high unemployment because we're degrowthing, um, that's everyone's gonna be mad. They're gonna elect fascists, uh, like real fascists. Um, they're gonna like not. They're gonna really want to hold on to their jobs and in carbon and in other extractive industries, where full employment can be a tool that makes market readjustments a lot easier. And even if you think that that is problematic in the short term, we really need to act in the short term. Is my political sell on it? I'm not a climate person in my policy world, but that is how I approach those arguments, especially in the short term. Though. You know, if we don't get enough done in the short term, what it looks like in the medium term now becomes a much more open question. All right. Well, we've got three more questions and a limited amount of time, so I'm not sure. Speed round. Um, I would say say again. Go speed round. Go speed round. Uh, Nikki asks, could you use could use of alternatives to the GDP promote a shift away from market dependency? If so, which are most promising, and how might it be elevated above GDP? Want to do yeah, so I'll, I'll go through these quick. So, uh, uh, so that one there is, that's not my world. Uh, our friends at Washington Center for Equitable Growth have done a lot about this. Um, Joe Stiglitz, who's our uh, economist at Roosevelt Institute and obviously Nobel Prize winning economist at Columbia, uh, has also written a lot about this. I know there's ways of thinking about not just alternatives to GDP, but alter alternatives to how the economy is structured in terms of the income distribution and who pays taxes. Um, that are all very promising. I think there's also a lot of work about not just um, GDP to be more inclusive about things like health and leisure and care, and um, which are really important internationally for the United States where our mortality rates like capitalism is just not keeping people alive as well as it used to in the United States, uh, but also more broadly about equity and, and um, uh, particularly racial equity and, and who gets left behind in a lot of these measures. I think there's a real boom and there's a lot of work being done on this right now. So if you're interested in that, this is a great time to look at that. I'm sorry, right. I don't know enough. Great. Um, James asks, where does Pentagon spending fit in in all of this? It seems it, it a political sacred cow that always precludes spending on social programs. So military spending. So if you look at the federal government, it does four things equally. It does Social Security. It does health care, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, and ACA. It does the military and does everything else, which is about 4 or 5% of GDP. Um, Cutting military spending, I think, is good because it will slow down the impulse to do more war things and uh, build out the war machine. Though at the end of the day, the choices around equitable economy really do have to involve taxing the rich for most of the things we need, um, taxing everyone for some other things like universal health care, and putting real restrictions on the market. And we should cut the military budget when it's appropriate because it's good to like slow down the war machine, but it's not that that is not 
enough spending at the scale we need to address the problems because we are fundamentally an undertaxed country and we are a, a, a very unequal country compared to our peer nations. So that's where the money is. So that's where you got to tax it. All right. And Peter asks, are we focusing too much with horse blinders on the economic issues while seemingly ignoring the more consequent primal underlying psychological factors? Is the real core of our climate crisis, for example, the fact that we and folks in socialist organized economies as well all define happiness as acquiring more stuff? Regardless of how well that additional stuff is distributed, its aggregate damage to the ecosystem is similar. I'll, I'll conclude on saying that um, in so much as there's two questions. One is, yes, I think we can often, so the, the reason the book is told is a history, and I maybe didn't convey that enough, is that um, it's really a history of, of how we talk about freedom and why we need to center arguments about struggle over freedom. Um, so we're not just caught in these like economic technocratic policy disputes on one hand, or these kind of more abstract philosophical deb um, debates about like, you know, what, what do we, you know, like what, what does liberalism actually entail in the market? And these like fights about, you know, whether or not people should be able to donate their organs while like people die because they can't afford insulin. Um, yeah, I think um, getting to that deeper psychological factor of how we experience freedom and who and, and how it exists in society, I think opens up a way of talking to people that gets beyond some of the more academic things we can kind of get caught in. Uh, as for, um, you know, acquiring more stuff and, you know, the ecosystem, I, I'm not enough on the frontier of the arguments about like so-called degrowth. Um, I do know that there's just a big distribution problem period in countries like the United States. And it, there's a way in which we can still have a much more equitable society that spends more on necessities, things that are important to us, while also dramatically reducing our carbon footprints uh, and the footprint of the uh, carbon footprints, the, the amount of carbon that our economy is putting in the atmosphere. So I I wouldn't want to I wouldn't want to put that conflict into it. I wouldn't want to assume the stark trade-off, like a more egalitarian society or like climate change, before we get to further along in the egalitarian economy. Because I think you can almost talk yourself into inaction on some things that are still very important because the changes we'll need to make need popular buy-in. And one way to get popular buy-in is that you will be more economically secure. Not just have more stuff, but you'll be less at risk. You'll, you'll have that freedom of economic security. And I think it's a very powerful thing. All right, we, this was excellent. I'm personally sorry it's over. Um, so I just wanted to mention uh, because uh, before we give you a, a send off and thanks um, that there are a couple of talks coming up that I think touch on issues that have been raised inclu including in the Q&A. So on, for us here at the Havens Wright Center um, on Tuesday, October 26th at 12 noon US Central Time, John Bellamy Foster will be giving a talk on Marxism, ecology and the climate crisis and then on November 4th at 12 noon U.S. Central Time, David Harvey and Kostas Slapovitsas will be discussing after neoliberalism, COVID crisis, and the future of capitalism. So those obviously have relevance to themes that Mike's talked about here. Um, again, really, I, we want to thank you for this talk. It was really enlightening and really stimulating. Uh, I actually have another question, but... Um, we can let people go and um, hope that you all will join us again for those other talks. You can register on our website. Um, so the question I've got is, um, what's your view of modern monetary theory and do you understand to, to what degree it's influenced the thinking of the Biden administration? I think um, it's a good question. It's, it's, it's a complicated one. We're still recording. Um, so. I think MMT is a series of statements um, that people agree with in different forms. So I think there's an argument that for a country like the United States, it cannot default on its debt unless it chooses to, or is legally imposed like a debt limit. And um, when we are away from full employment and away from capacity, deficits do not matter. Um, that is very important. And I think that is true. And I think that's a Keynesian insight. Um, I think it is interesting to watch, and this is where I'm very um, defensive of MMT or, or very uh, happy for MMT as well, 
uh, is that um, you'll see economists like say like, well, that everyone knows that, or that's not new, or that's in Keynes. Yet it's like, but they don't say that in public and they don't say that to policymakers for sure. And um, I, I don't know if this is helpful, but you know, it's um, someone described it as like the law when you know you have law professors who are like, privately or to their students perhaps are like yes the law and courts are essentially about power and essentially about like executing like political visions and priorities um and then but then like publicly like are like oh the law is this like abstract debate about like you know logic and and interpreting you know calling balls and strikes kind of thing and knowing that like there's a public argument and a private argument, and same thing with economists, where it's like there's a public argument. It's like, oh my god, you got to worry about the deficit. It's like, don't you can't do too much too fast. Uh, but then privately, they're like, of course, the deficit for a country like the United States doesn't matter. And um, MMT just helping break that open has been very helpful. There's a bunch of other corollary MMT arguments about um, job guarantees, about the nature of money, about uh, a couple other things, about the financial system, which I think are less core and, and come and go in different varying degrees. And some of them I, I know better than others. Some of them I'm, I'm more or less comfortable with. So I don't, I, I sign up as a Keynesian of which I'm very happy that MMT has gotten a lot of these insights out there, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it does. All right, well, thanks for going over time to answer that. No problem. All right. Thanks well, for again, having me, everyone. I really appreciate everyone being here. This is wonderful. I'm a, I, I don't know, it wasn't in the bio. I, it was in the bio online. Um, I'm a University of Illinois grad, so few hours away, but I used to go to Madison all the time. I heard the Essen House survived the, the pandemic, which is I'm very happy about if it did. Actually, uh, but I I, huge I amounts of love for Madison and, and, uh, and the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So I'm very honored to have been here. All right, well, thanks. And everybody should take a ch check out Mike's book. I know I will for sure. So um, there it is, Freedom from the Market. All right. Take care, everyone. Thank you. You too. Thanks, thanks. Mike, good to see you. Bye.